Good morning, Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our, our online service. I'm going to be talking about being set free to worship. But before we get to that, can you do a couple of things? Can you like this message? Can you also, in the, in, in the section there on YouTube, just hit the like button, send a link to other people. Let's get as many people as possible watching our online services. All right. I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. If you wanted to be close to someone, what would you do? Think back in your own experience. If you wanted to build a relationship with somebody, you, you know, you called them, maybe now we text them, you reach out to somebody, you talk to somebody, right? You be nice to somebody, you express care and concern and just be gracious and, and nice to somebody, right? What if that situation is hampered by the fact that there's a relational breach there's a rift between you and that person, right? Now what do you do? Now obviously if it's, if it's something that you did, it's incumbent upon you as much as you can to, to ask for forgiveness and to try to extend some form of an olive branch taking ownership of maybe something that you did wrong. But let's say the issue was not yours, let's say the issue is on the other person's behalf, right? The other person committed the sin. The other person committed the breach. The other person did or said something that legitimately harmed you. Now what do you do, right? How do you deal with that situation? You know, uh, and, and so when we think about that scenario, that is not unlike God <laughs> looking on the human race and seeing this incredible breach or gulf in the relationship between himself and fallen rebellious humanity, right? That, that, that's kind of the scenario that the Bible in both Old and New Testaments reveals to us. And, and the entirety of the Bible is God's overt attempt to take the initiative himself, to unilaterally by himself breach the relationship, whether it was in the Old Testament sacrificial systems or in the New Testament by sending his son in the form in Jesus to die on a cross to restore the relationship back to humanity, right? That, that's, that's biblical Christianity 101. And that's also worship 101. Because when you look at Old Testament books like Exodus, or Leviticus. For many Christians, particularly if you get past the first 20 chapters of Exodus, um, <laughs> many Christians, their eyes glaze over because suddenly now you're into the ritualistic uh, uh, and ceremonial system whereby God gave Moses all these rules and regulations to approach him. But, but again, it's interesting. God took the initiative. God, in an act of grace, gave his Old Testament, the Old Covenant, uh, the Old Testament law, as a means by which that, that basically humanity can now approach him. So, so God was reaching out. But again, it was all about how can fallen, sinful, rebellious humanity approach a holy God when that holy God, because he is holy 
and he is pure and he is completely righteous and just cannot be in the presence of wicked sinful humanity. His wrath would befall humanity. That's not good, right? So, so when you see in Exodus chapters 20 to the end and you look at the book of Leviticus and all of the prescribed rules of the Levitical priesthood, it has everything to do with at least two things. Number one, how can an unholy people approach a holy God? But second of all, it deals with worship. How can I worship God? How can I draw near to this living God and be in his presence? How can I have an abiding, living relationship? That's what it's all about. And so I want to talk about that today uh, to an extent. I don't know how deeply I can get into this in the limited format that we have via YouTube. But I want to talk about how God in Christ frees us to worship him. And hopefully in the process of talking about this, this will provoke you or prompt you to worship God uh, more deeply. Because you'll realize God took the initiative to restore a broken relationship. And if you can reflect upon, even in your own life, maybe you have harbored an offense towards somebody that's gone on for days, weeks, months, maybe years, right? And that other person did you wrong. And so you're waiting for them to do the right thing, and they don't, when it could perhaps be incumbent upon you to reach out to them. How long have you or I been stubborn in that kind of a scenario? And yet what we see in the Bible, as early as Genesis chapter 3.15, in the sin of Adam and Eve, where God proposes a plan to reach out and save and redeem humanity by a unilateral act of God who takes the initiative. So I want to talk about that in light of worship and how God frees us in Christ to worship him. I want you to look at Hebrews, the, the 10th chapter, verses 19 to 22. It says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let's, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Can we pray? Father God, as we contemplate how you, through the atoning sacrifice of Christ, reached out to fallen humanity because you wanted a relationship with humanity, God, I pray, let that revelation prompt us to worship you more intensively. Prompt us to devote ourselves to you, Lord, more intentionally. God, I pray, let it stir us to be more intentional, intentional to be more faith-filled as we approach you in worship. I pray for this now, in Jesus' name, amen. So the scripture tells us here in Hebrews 10, and Hebrews is all about this, but in particular, Hebrews 10, it talks about we can enter the Holy of Holies, something that the high priest could only do once a year, uh, and war wearing a, a particular garment, speaking of the robes of righteousness when we are in Christ, we can enter the presence of God every single day, every single moment of our life, if we want to. Again, that is an inestimable privilege afforded to us because of what Jesus has done for us at the cross of Calvary. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, there's a new and there's a living way open for us through Jesus. So because of that, let us draw near to God, right? Let, let us become intimate with God. Let us get close to God. There is no more breach in the relationship. There is no enmity. God is not wrathful toward us anymore because of what Jesus has done. So why don't you, why don't I, <laughs> with reckless abandon, if you prefer, begin to approach God? Now, obviously in reference, reverence, but, but, but again, don't stay at a distance, draw near. And it says, draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. So it tells us that God is the preeminent peacemaker in the world, right? It far surpasses anything that the United Nations has ever done or will ever think to do because God took the initiative to make peace in Christ. In fact, we see this in a couple of scriptures if you want to turn to them. Colossians 1.20 and 2 Corinthians 5.18. 
Let's read Colossians 1.20. Again, talking about God as the preeminent peacemaker in the world. Through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood <clears throat> shed on the cross. So it talks about that what Jesus did for us at the cross is it, he made peace. He reconciled everything back to God. Not just humanity, but all of creation. The entire created cosmos that has been thoroughly messed up because of the rebellious sin of Adam and Eve. All of that is going to be rectified. All of that has been rectified to God in Christ Jesus. And in the end of all things, everything's going to be restored. And God doesn't lose a lick of what was lost because of the fall. Everything's going to be restored. New heavens, new earth, no crying, no shame, no pain, no, no sickness anymore, no death. It's going to be incredible because of what God has done for us in Christ. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. All this is from God, who reconciled to us, to himself, through Christ. So God was in Christ reconciling the world. It says this in verse 19a. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And so this reconciliation cost God nothing less than the death of his son. That's how much God loves you. That's how God, much God loves me. That's how much God loves the whole world. Is that he, through Christ, was effecting the reconciliation. He, he was offended. <laughs> humanity was offended. Why was humanity offended toward God? Because man wants to be autonomous. Man wants to call his own shots. We see this all over the place in America today. Uh, again, one has to look no further than the, the current sexual revolution and LGBTQ+, plus and all of those iterations, and gender dysphoria, and transgenderism. We've got a generation of young people that are saying to God, we reject the fact that you created us. We reject the fact of embodied existence as you gave it to us as a gift. We reject that. We are going to, by our own autonomous reason, and logic, and authority, create our own unique sexuality, our own unique identity. We're going to create for ourselves what it means to be human. We're going to reject what you gave us, right? <laughs> is that something that evokes God's hostility? Sure it is. Because we are trampling upon the precious gift of life and creation and, and fleshed embodied existence that God gave us. We're saying to that gift, we trash it, we're throwing it away in the dumpster. All right? And God said, okay, that's a fundamental problem. <laughs> You're never going to be in a relationship with me if you live and think and act like that. So I'm going to take the initiative. I'm going to, through Jesus, reconcile the world to me. Now, are you going to receive that? Are you going to receive that incredible gift that, you've, that, that I've given to you? That's what God's done for us. And what that does is it procures for us the ability to be in right relationship with God, but not just that, to have intimate fellowship and communion with God. That's all about what worship is all about. And we see the pattern for that in the Old Testament Exodus, where the children of Israel were in bondage to Pharaoh, right? They were in bondage, they, they were in slavery, they were brutally treated, they cried out to God for deliverance, and of course God delivered them in the person of Moses and sending, sending what, what the Bible says in Exodus was a destroyer that destroyed the firstborn of Egypt and the children of Israel had to put blood on the lintel on their doorposts and the destroyer would pass over them. That was a type of deliverance from not just physical slavery, but a type of deliverance from sin and deliverance from, from the devil that Jesus brought about for us at, at the cross of Jesus. So when we see the Israelites set free from the bondage of Pharaoh, and we see Pharaoh's army, you know, basically destroyed in, in the Red Sea, and we see the children of Israel going out into the wilderness, they're brought at the foot of Mount Sinai for what purpose? To be, to, to be drawn near to God. To be intimate with God. To have a relationship with God. To worship God. God begins to set up the Levitical priesthood because God was saying, listen, the reason I'm delivering you, the reason I'm bringing you into this wilderness away from the world, 
away from the bondage of Pharaoh and all of the slavery that that entails, is I am setting you free, as it were, from sin so that you can draw near to me and worship me. I'm setting you free to worship. And that's exactly what God, through Christ, has done for those that choose to follow him. In fact, look at Hebrews chapter 12, 22 to 23. This is exactly what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. He says this, he says, But you have come to Mount Zion, think of Mount Sinai, now Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. So he's drawing an analogy, as it were, that the current church, the current people of God, that have been delivered because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, set free from sin, set free from the devil, set free from the world, right? Set free and brought into this seeming wilderness experience, right? Between the now and the not yet, right? We haven't fully come into glory. We're not fully with the Lord. However, we can be, uh, to, to a degree, with the Lord in this place, in time, in these last days. The, the same wilderness or, or discontent many times that we feel that we're not with the Lord and we're not directly in His presence is the same disconnect, discontent that the children of Israel experienced in the wilderness. It's a type of that. But he says, listen, you are the church of the firstborn. You've been set free to worship me, to draw near to me. That's what Jesus has done. He wants people close to him. He wants people to draw near to him. Why is this significant? Because there's at least seven different words in the Old Testament for praise that talk about drawing near to the Lord. And what's amazing to me is that many Christians, they don't understand worship. Uh, I've had some individuals that stopped going to our church because we take 30 to 40 minutes on a Sunday morning and worship God in song. And I've had individuals go, why do you do that? Why don't you just get to the good stuff? Let's get to the message. Let's get to the sermon, right? And they fail to understand what redemption is is that Jesus has set us free from sin and the devil and the world and the flesh so that we may commune with him, so that we may, may have fellowship with him, so that we may worship him. He set us free to worship him. Worship is not a means to a greater end. It is actually an end in itself in that we've been set free to be in relationship with God. Let me say it another way. I think many Christians who, in a worship service in a church, because of maybe lack of understanding or lack of teaching or even lack of an awareness of the enormity of the redemption that Jesus has brought them, again, they hold back in worship and they fail to recognize that the God that you claim to serve, the God that you claim to follow, wants intimacy and fellowship and relationship with you, communion with you more than you do. If you would just draw near in lifting up your hands or praising him with the sacrifice of praise with our voice, lips giving praise as Hebrews 13 talks about, as we begin to draw near maybe clapping or, or, or dancing or, or, or bowing before him as all of these words in, of, of praise in the Hebrew talk about, we are drawn into a closer relationship with God. Because again, God wants relationship with us. Think it through. There was an unbridgeable chasm between you and God. You and your creator. That's true of me. That's true of you. That's true of every single person in the world. And God breached that. God bridged that chasm. God was in Christ reconciling the world. Why? Because as the church of the firstborn, the Hebrews 12 talks about, he set us free to worship him. He set us free to draw near to him. And the scripture says, in his presence is fullness of joy. The book of Acts talks about, for those that repent before the Lord, it talks about times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. In other words, even beyond the intimate relationship with God that ensues to those that choose to worship him in song and with their lives, some of the byproducts are absolutely incredible. Fullness of joy, peace, grace, refreshing, 
cleansing, healing, wholeness. So, so as I close this message this morning, the challenge to all of us is, do you know that you've been freed by Jesus at the cross to worship him? Again, let's look at the scripture once again in Hebrews 10. It says, We have confidence to enter this most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. Let us draw near to God with sincere hearts in full assurance of faith. Why? Because we've come to Mount Zion. We are the church of the firstborn. He set us free to draw near to him. So here's the challenge today to me. Here's the challenge today to you. How close to Jesus do you want to be? How much do you or I realize the the enormous cost borne by God through Christ to bring us to that place where we can worship Him? Do we understand that's how much God wants to be close to you? That's how much God wants to be close to me. And so it should prompt us to draw near to the Lord in prayer, in worship, in song, as much as we can, spending time with God because in that time we are changed. In fact, the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 3, it talks about the fact that we are transformed into his image from glory to glory by the presence of the Lord. Who wouldn't want that? I I tell you what, I know I want that, and the Lord is dealing with me about that. And I just wanted to share some principles that I thought would be encouraging to you and also hopefully a challenge for all of us to become more worshipful of the Lord because He wants a relationship with us. We've been set free to worship. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word this morning in Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 12. And now it reveals to us, God, that we've been set free to worship. So God, my prayer for me, my prayer for every person listening to this message is God draws closer to you. God, help us to be a people that we push through indifference. We push through depression. We push through struggle. We push through any type of hindrance and begin to pursue you, God, to pursue you with a a greater level of intensity because, God, you desire intimacy with us more than we with you. So, God, I pray this and I ask for this now and I bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, it was great to be with you and until next week, I call you blessed. Take care.